know what to say. It's not a special guest. He's not a, 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 a special speaker or uh, he's a brother. Amen. And so, Liddell, won't you come up? Steve, you'll bring the... Liddell Elliott has moved into a new season. <laughs> Hallelujah. He has uh, moved away from combating or combat with his fingers. Um, and I think occasionally he uses his head. Hallelujah. He is a master of many arts of uh, martial arts. He carries several black belts, but that does, has nothing in the spirit realm compared to the anointing that God has placed on his life. And so he is launching out into full-time ministry. He has sold the gym. And so that is awesome. Amen. But what he has done in the in this natural, I expect and pull on that, that we begin to see him warring in the spirit for the lost. He carries an evangelistic gift. He's very prophetic. And I... I want you to then come with expectation as he delivers a word today. And so I want you to connect your faith with mine and let's put a draw upon the anointing in his life. Amen. So, Father, I thank you for my brother. I thank you for the season, Father, that we prophetically really spoke over him in 2020. I still remember the it was a Tuesday, Wednesday, one of those days on, a, on an afternoon that we prophetically spoke over him. And he, he grabbed a hold of that word as it has ignited his spirit and contacted me the day after and said, I feel I've, as if I have been launched into ministry. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. We thank you for the gifting. Father, we thank you for the voice that he has to speak to this house. Mm. <laughs> when God spoke, the timbers shattered. And as he begins to roar and now the lion of Judah to roar through him, Father, I thank you for every demonic situation going on in our lives and around this place that it will run and flee. Yes. We submit to thee. We submit to thee. <laughs> in Jesus' mighty name, we allow the anointing to flow in such a way that will destroy all burdens and yokes. In Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you for his season that he's coming up, the tent revivals that he's got planned for this month. Father, may we as a congregation gather around him not only in the spirit, in prayer, but also in finances. And Father, I thank you, Lord, Father, that we begin to see a great harvest. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for allowing me to uh, speak with you today. I want to thank Pastor Mike. Pastor Mike, I, I really want to just take a second and just uh, tell you how much I appreciate you. This man has been speaking into my life since, what, four years now? And uh, <clears throat> I, I, I consider myself a part of World Harvest, even though you don't see me every Sunday. It's because I'm, I'm, I minister at a Bible study and uh, there was just a word inside me, and I knew I had to get out and minister. And there was a group of people that uh, we were ministering to that just you wouldn't see come to regular church. And at our Bible study, we have had everybody. We've had Muslims. We've had people that weren't saved. We've had people that came from different backgrounds, uh, Baptist, Catholic, Methodist. And, and to every one of them, we've introduced the Holy Ghost and introduced... You know, this Pentecostal message, this Pentecostal message of power, this Pentecostal message that the, that the apostles preached in the book of Acts and went into all the world, amen? And, yes. and I believe the church is still called to preach that message, a full gospel message, a message of power, 
a message of Jesus. The world needs Jesus, and you can't say it enough that the gospel that needs to be preached is a gospel of Jesus. Amen? Amen. We need to give Jesus to the world because that's what the, the world is lacking. We don't, we don't need a message that is um, a feel-good, you're just a great person, all this. We don't need a, a motivational message. How many knows that motivation only lasts so long? But when the trials and tribulations of life begin to happen, motivation will leave out the front door. It'll go out the same door that it came in. But the gospel said heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. Amen? Amen. The gospel stands. The gospel stands. Do I need it? I, I probably can preach yeah. without it. All right. The gospel stands, amen? The gospel stands. It's a, it's, a play, it's a rock that you can build a foundation on. You can build a house upon. You can build a ministry on. You can build your marriage on it. You can build your family on it. You can build your business on it. You can build whatever that your dreams and hopes and things are. It's built upon the gospel, amen? The gospel of Jesus. I love Jesus. How many loves Jesus today? How many remembers Catherine Kuhlman? Anybody watch some Catherine Kuhlman videos? Catherine Kuhlman was a strange lady, wasn't she? She was so dramatic. And, you know, she would, she would do this thing and she, and she would say, she would say, don't you grieve the Holy Spirit. He's all that I have. And sometimes, for me, I, I'm not an educated person. I'm not, I'm not really a good speaker. I wait on him. Branham would go to meetings. Anybody ever heard of William Branham? William Branham was probably one of the greatest ministers in the, in the last 100 years. A man of God. He would call up people and, and tell them things about things that happened in their life 15 years ago. He died in 1965. But powerful minister. Powerful minister. But he would wait on the Holy Ghost... And if he got to a service and he did not feel the Spirit, he wouldn't preach. And there were times that he shut down entire revivals because he said, the Spirit's not here, I can't do it. He would not go in the pulpit. He would wait in the back until he got the green light to go. How many knows that we need a church and a body like that so in tune to what the Holy Spirit wants to say. Amen. So in tune to what God wants to do. So in tune that we let go of our agendas, that we let go of our time clocks, that we let go of everything and we say, God, I can't do it without you. God, I can't minister without your presence. God, I don't want to minister without your presence. God, I don't, I don't want it to be me in the pulpit. You, in yourself, you can do nothing. We can't do anything. You cannot do anything if you're a Christian without Christ. If you go to do it on your own, it'll fail every time. Men have stepped out to do things on their own and, and lost everything because they did it on their own. Jesus, I don't want to do it on my own. I want to do it with you, Jesus. I want to do it that I stand in your shadow. In, in Psalms 91, it says, He that abides under the shadow of the Almighty. What shadow do I abide under? I abide under the shadow of the cross. That where I go, the cross goes with me. The cross of Calvary. The blood-stained cross of Calvary that is ever-present. The power of the gospel that is ever present. 
the Jesus of Isaiah 53 that was wounded for my transgressions, that was bruised for my iniquities, the chastisement of his peace, the chastisement of my peace was upon him. Amen. And with his stripes... I am healed. That's the, that's the shadow that I'm under. That's the shadow that I want to abide under. Amen? I want to abide in that shadow. I want to walk in that power. I want to walk in the power of the cross, the power of the gospel, the power of Jesus. We need a Jesus church. We need a Jesus ministry. We need a people that speak Jesus. We need a people that preach Jesus. We need a people that prophesy Jesus. We need, a, we need a people that heal in Jesus' name. Amen. We need a people that cast out devils in Jesus' name. Amen. We need a people that raise the dead in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. We need a Jesus' name ministry. We need a Jesus' name power. We need power. Amen. And that power, amen, he said, no man can get to the Father but through me. You can't find it in any other way. Amen. Muhammad won't get you anywhere. Buddha won't get you anywhere. But Jesus will get you salvation. The cross of Calvary will get you to heaven. Amen. Amen. There's only one name that is given, and that is the name of Jesus, whereby men can be saved. That is the power of the gospel. That is the power of the gospel. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you about four things today. Before I do that, before I get into my message, just real quick, I, I do want to give a little bit of an of a advertisement, we, uh, which I'm super excited about. If I have just a moment, say, okay, Pastor, if I just take a second on this. We are preaching a Holy Ghost tent revival in Cushing, Oklahoma, and we're going to start July 6th, and we're going to go through the 11th. And it's right there on uh, Cleveland. Well, the address is on the flyer. And so we're going to be preaching every night there, 7 p.m. I used to put up tents back in the day and preached under them some and, and all this. So this will be the first time that I've been under a tent preaching since I think around 2003. So if you'll come out, if you're free that week, man, we'd love to have you come out and fellowship with us. On July the 5th, the tent will be up, and we're going to just take a night and pray over the tent and anoint it with oil and pray over the chairs and everything and pray that God would just bless us and, 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 and pour it out. Amen? So, anyway, uh, I have some flyers up here, and, and uh, I'm just going to lay them right up here, and if anybody feels led or something, if, if you want to grab a flyer or if you want to take it and put it up somewhere for me, well, that'd be a great, huge help, and we would appreciate you for it. Amen? But don't take it if you're going to put it in your car and just leave it there. <laughs> Amen. I have to get my glasses out of here. I've gotten to a certain age where I can't see without my glasses. It's pretty bad, huh? It's part, part of getting older. <clears throat> I want to read something to you. This was a prophetic word that the Lord gave me. And then I'm going to go into my message. I've never, ever wrote down a prophetic word before, but I wrote this word down. I got it, and it was in my prayer time. And as I started praying, I just felt that the Lord was really impressing upon me to write this down. And uh, so I wanted to read it to you just real quick. I, I received this on April the 7th of this year. And it said, My people have imprisoned their hearts with seeds of doubt and unbelief. These are the seeds of Satan to rob you of your promise. My people are living in a wilderness of provision. And they cry out to me for their disappointments. Hear me, saith the Lord, hearken to my word, believe the voice of your God. Repair your heart, says the Lord. Tear down the walls of doubt. Remove the gates of unbelief and build a house of promise. Yea, build a heart of faith, saith the Lord, and nothing shall be impossible to you, says the Lord your God. I, I read that because I'm going to talk about it a little bit in, in, in the message today. 
If you've got your Bibles, I want you to go with me to Joel chapter 2. In, in, this, in this message today, this message, I believe, is a spiritual principle that can change, that can change your, your life. Of course, all spiritual principles can do that. But you can take this formula and you can change your business, you can change your marriage, you can change your family, you can change relationships, you can change, you can change anything. There's four steps four steps and the first step is correction the second step is repentance the third step is restoration and the fourth step is revival and you'll see that in every area of life if you're driving down the highway you know those little things that's on the side of the road that when your your tire hits it and your car starts going like this well, those things are there to protect you because that lets you know you need to correct your steering. I need to get back in the lane because if I keep going, I'm going to go off into a ditch or go off into a tree or go off into a fence. Correction is good for us. Amen? Correction and instruction are the things that we need. That's why we listen to the, our fathers, the apostles and the prophets. Most of the New Testament is what? It's correction to the church. It's instruction and it's correction to the church. He's speaking on how to live. He's speaking on what not to do. And he's telling you, he's telling you the promises and the provisions that you walk in. It's instruction and correction to the church. And when the church gets off, when the church gets, if, when it deviates, when it gets... Just like the church of Galatia, they had some preachers come in that preached a different message than Paul. And they got a little bit off. And the apostle Paul came and said, no, we got to get this corrected. If we don't get this corrected, what's going to happen is, is you're really going to get lost into this. And so we need to right the ship. Sometimes you need, to, you need to get the car right back into the lane that you're in. Amen? It's correction. Correction. Correction and instruction. Correction and instruction. I believe that there's coming a great global revival. I believe that. Steve, I believe that with all my heart. I believe that there is coming a revival. And that we're going to have an Azuzu or a Brownsville in every nation. Every nation. We've had outpourings where it was here or there. But I believe in this last day revival that it's going to be in every nation. There'll be somewhere. There'll be an Azuzu in Russia. There'll be an Azuzu in India. There'll be an Azuzu. There's going to be an outpouring. And I don't know what all that'll look like, but there's going to be an outpouring. And then I believe Jesus will come back. I believe this is going to be the last day revival. You may not believe that way. That's how I believe. We can disagree on that if you'd like, but... I do believe that there's a revival. And I believe that revival is to prepare and to call out the last people to get ready for that trump to sound. That's what I believe, Pastor Mike. I believe in an end time, last day revival. Amen? Man, you guys are quiet today. Who? I need somebody. I need an amen corner. I need some. I need some. I tell you what. I need a couple. I, I need a couple guys right here. Uh, just whoever wants to be, come over here and just, I need an amen corner right here. And so when I, when, when there's, come on, you're going to make the, pa <laughs> you're going to make the pastor pick up the slack. Come on. Is anybody else saved in this place? Come on now. Amen. There we go. My goodness. For a second, I thought I was in a Methodist church. The way everybody was looking at me. Oh, look out now. I'm just joking with you. I'm just teasing. Nobody get offended. I got to give you a little bit of a hard time. Got to wake you up a little bit, right? Amen. But see, if you don't amen me, I think you won't. I, don't, I, I, I begin to think you don't like me. And, and I hope that's not the truth because I like you. Yeah, that's good. 
In Joel chapter 2, I believe Joel chapter 2 lays out the foundation of correction, repentance, restoration, and revival. I believe Joel chapter 2 is a prophetic and is speaking of the last days. I believe that in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, speaks of correction, and it speaks of an army. Now, if you go into most um, commentaries and things like that, they're going to say that this is a pagan army. I do not believe that's what Joel was talking about, and I believe it confirms it in actually verse 11. This army that Joel sees because we're speaking prophetically, Joel is seen in the last day, this army that he sees is the army of the Lord. And this army is a great and mighty army. And I believe that this army is something that is a spiritual, um, a spiritual, what did you call that when you said it's, it repeats itself? It's a spiritual, secular, it's a, it's a spiritual cycle it's a wheel. It has to repeat itself. Amen. Before Jesus came, who came first? It was John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, in Matthew chapter 3, it speaks of John the Baptist, and it says that he would lay the axe to the root of the tree. And he would tear down every tree that didn't bring forth good fruit. Can I take a moment, a second? Can I take a moment and show you something? Is that all right? Is anybody in a hurry? When they, when they sinned in the Garden of Eden, what tree did they eat of? The knowledge of good and evil. Good and evil became our DNA. That's part of the original sin. Everything that you do in life, you're presented with a choice. Do I do good or do I do evil? Yeah. Paul said, every time I go to do good, evil is present. Yes. Yes. Amen. Even in ministry. You get in ministry. I remember one time I was broke. It was back way back when when I used to do ministry and I tried to do it. I went out of the Lord's season, tried to do it on my own, failed miserably. And I was broke, and I remember one time this man, he opened up his wallet, and he had all these $100 bills in front of me. And he was just trying to tempt me with it. Good, evil is always present, even when you're doing ministry. Yes. Yes. Amen. Come on now. Yeah. That's how ministries fail. Yes. They get presented by financial things, power things, physical things. And something comes along and can trip them up because it's presented good and evil. That's the tree that Adam and Eve ate of. And when they ate of that tree, it went into our DNA. And that's just like kids, even when they're three years old. Don't, you, you can't eat this cookie yet and you'll see that kid and he'll say, good and evil's there. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, I want that cookie. Man, dad's not looking. I want that cookie so bad. Good and evil's present. Good and evil is present. Trees, the fruit of the tree can be messages. It can be messages. And when I partake of a message that's not scriptural, or I partake of a message that's not the gospel... That's why Paul came to the church of Galatia and he said, you got to watch these ministers that you're bringing in because they're preaching, they're preaching things that's going to bring you back under bondage. You've been freed and now they're trying to put you into religion. They're trying to put you back under the law, but God redeemed you from the law by the blood of Jesus. And he said, don't you partake of that message. Don't eat of that fruit. It's evil. The most dangerous fruit to the church is the fruit that looks like the gospel. But just enough of it has been changed that it'll steer your vehicle off course. Let me just change the persona of Jesus a little bit and everything's messed up. 
oh, Jesus is just a prophet. It's not going to work. Oh, Jesus is the Son of God, but He's not God in the flesh. Jesus is another God. Hear me. Just a little bit. And I don't care how good they live. I don't care how well they dressed. And I don't care how righteous they appear to be. If that message is not Jesus... The Son of God who is God in the flesh, amen. It's not a message from God. You can cast that down. That's a false prophet. That's a lying prophet. And that's a lying spirit. Come on now. Oh, I feel it. I feel the Holy Ghost. I don't know if you can feel it, but I can feel it. And so... John came by, John came in the ministry of Elijah, and the ministry of Elijah is correction and instruction. Yeah, yeah. Amen. And that's what John came to do, because before the people that were ready to receive Jesus could receive him, there had to be a ministry of correction, and the ministry of correction was exactly what it said. He came to take the axe to the root of the false gospel that was being preached at that time by the Pharisees, and he came to give them a gospel of power and of life. Amen. Amen. He said, I came to lay the axe to the root of the tree. And today I've come to lay the axe to the root of the tree. I've come to lay the axe to the root of the tree because I'm going to tell you something. Some of you, you've been wrestling with things that you shouldn't be wrestling with and God wants to deliver you of it. There's some of you that have been fighting battles in your mind and God wants to free you from it. There's some of you, you may have sickness in your body and God wants to heal you. But there's been something that's been speaking in your ear. You've been eating up a fruit that's not the gospel and it may be some doubt and unbelief that's trying to rob you and keep you in provision instead of you walking in promise. Amen. Oh, amen. come on now. Come on, somebody. Oh, can I preach today? Can I tell you the truth? God wants you free. God wants you free. He doesn't want you in provision. He wants you in promise. You hear me? Provision is I get just what I need. I get just, you know, we, we have a... A little dabble do you kind of service. <laughs> We're praying for a Holy Ghost revival and we get interpretation of tongues. That, that's good. We're praying for healing and deliverance. And, you know, we have one every once in a while. That's provision. That's not the book of Acts, church. And there's nothing wrong with that. I love God's provision. Hey, I'd rather live under provision than live without it. But what I've come to do today to tell you is that God is getting ready to do something else and He's getting ready to bring you out of provision. He's getting ready to bring you out of... Brother, He's getting ready to bring you out of provision. He's getting ready to bring you out of provision into promise. He wants you into the fullness of the gifts. He wants you in the fullness of the Word. He wants you to have understanding of the revelation of the Word. He wants to wake you up in the middle of the night so He can give you words of revelation and words. Amen. Amen. He wants to reveal the Word to you. He wants to share the Word with you. He wants you to walk a life of promise. Come on now. You know it's the truth. Am I preaching truth? Yeah. Am, I, am I preaching truth? Yeah. Yeah. Joel chapter 2 verses 1 through 11 describes an army. And it describes an army that is unified. It describes an army that is not divided. It describes an army, amen, that, it, that the sword won't take them down. It describes an army of invulnerability. 
and it describes that army, and I believe that is, Pastor Mike, I believe what we're getting ready to see is we're getting ready to see Elijah-type ministries raise up. We're getting ready to see, amen, in Malachi, it says before the coming of the Lord that Elijah would come first, the messenger of God, the voice in the wilderness. Elijah's got to, well, Jesus is coming back. That means before he comes back again, what has to happen? Why? Because he gets you ready. It's the ministry of correction and instruction. It's the ministry to prepare you for what God wants for you. It's the ministry to hack away the unessentials that you don't need. After correction and instruction, then what happens? Repentance. Repentance is always, you know, the church of Galatia, we look at, people don't preach on repentance. Now, I know Pastor Mike does, but people don't preach on repentance very much anymore. That's because in some churches, the way that they present it is, is oh, don't say things like repentance because that, you know, that's, you know, we don't want to paint negative messages and things like that. We want people to just feel comfortable. And so we're going to talk about being saved, but we're not going to talk about repenting. Is that truth? I, I, I'm not going to name the minister, but this guy, he recorded this minister and he spent three months listening to his messages. And in three months of his, listening to his messages, I think he said repentance three times. But he preached on hope and everything else and a lot. But how many knows that repentance is what got me to love and hope? Yeah. Amen. And repentance means to turn. And so when I get corrected, when I'm steering and I'm starting to go offline and I feel the bumps on the road, what do I have to do? Turn. I have to repent. Amen. Repentance. In repentance, there's power. And that's why the enemy fights against it. He fights against it. He doesn't want you to hear that message because in repentance, there's power. There's power in repentance. And you should live in repentance. See, we've taken repentance and we've, we've linked it with condemnation and that's a lie from Satan. Amen. Repentance is what gets rid of condemnation. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Amen. Yeah. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Yeah. Repentance gets rid of that lie. It gets rid of that falsehood. And Jesus said, you need to live in repentance. You say, well, where's that at? Well, it's in the Lord's Prayer. What did he say about forgiving? He said, forgive, forgive me my debts as I forgive those who've... Yes, forgive me my transgressions as... Amen. He was speaking of living in repentance. He said, actually he said, when you're at the altar... And he said, you're making a request. If it comes to your mind that your brother has ought against you... Oh, you got to pick it up and you got to go make things right. You need to go make peace because if you'll make peace, then I'll be able to answer that prayer. But until you make peace and when you got that ought in your heart and you got those things that's in your heart, you know why he's telling you to get rid of it? Because he wants to bless you. He wants to anoint you. He wants to give you things. He wants to answer that prayer. But he can't answer that prayer if the heart isn't right. Oh, I know this ain't real popular. Come on. But it's truth. It's truth. We need a gospel that doesn't tickle our ears, but we need a gospel that puts a fire under our backside. You get a fire under your backside, you're not going to sit there looking bored. Man, if I was listening to preaching like this, I'd be like this on the edge of my seat. Come on. Come on, somebody. Come on, come on. Amen. Preach it. There's correction, instruction, then there's repentance. Repentance brings restoration. Repentance brings restoration. Joel chapter 2 verses 12 through 17 speaks of repentance. 
And we see the power of restoration in 2 Chronicles 7.14. I mean, the power of repentance. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, what? Will humble themselves. Then what's going to happen? They begin to repent. They turn from where they're going. I'll begin, I'll hear from heaven. And I'll heal their lands. I'll bring restoration. Repentance brings restoration. Yes, amen. Amen. <laughs> it brings restoration. And you can see that in Joel chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. I'm going to read from Joel chapter 2, 23. It says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. Amen. The canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. That's what he was speaking of earlier. When the great army came among them, what did they do? They preached correction. They preached instruction. Then the children of Israel repented. And when the children of Israel repented, then there came restoration and the promise of restoration. The promise of restoration. And he said, I will restore to you the years. I want to ask somebody, if you, if you were honest, how many has lost some years? How many has the devil stolen from some years from you that you're looking to get back? How many of you is like a Caleb that remembered that a number of years ago there was a land that you had a mountain in that you wanted, but some people said, no, we can't go over. So you had to stay behind until that faithless, unbelieving generation died off. And then you had to go get it. Well, God promised him because he was faithful for restoration. Some of you got some restoration coming your way. Some of you got your mountain that you need to pick back up again. Come on. Oh, I get happy when I hear this. Some of you, God wants to restore. He wants to restore your ministry. He wants to restore your marriage. He wants to restore your mind. Some of you war so much in your mind. Come on. Some of you fight. You fight that battle of your mind and, you, and, and one day you're winning and one day you're losing. One day you're up and one day you're down. But God doesn't want you up and down. God wants you walking straight. God wants you healed and delivered. Come on. God wants to restore you. He wants to restore you. He wants to restore that relationship. He wants to restore that relationship. Amen. Remember the church that Jesus, one of the, the churches in the book of Revelation, and he said, you guys have been doing pretty good, but there's one thing that I have against you, and that you've lost your first love. And what I want you to do is, is I just want you to repent and go back and get your first love again. And then I'll restore it to you. I'll restore that glory to you. I'll restore that. I, I cancel you to buy gold tried in the fire. Buy gold of me. Amen. I'll restore you. I'll give you. I'll give it back to you. What the enemy has tried to steal from you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, somebody praise him. Hallelujah. Somebody praise him. Hallelujah. Somebody praise him. Hallelujah. Young man, you look like an obedient young man. If I tell you to do something, will you do it for me? Sure. I want you to get up and I want you to run around this church and then come back to your seat. Ready? Go. Come on now, come on. If you want restoration, you're going to have to work for it. You can't sit there like a bump on the log staring at me. Come on now, you're going to have to get into this thing. Come on. How many wants, how many wants some restoration today? How many wants some deliverance today? How many wants to go to another level? My God, my God, my God. I'm tired of the devil being in the, my family. I'm tired of the devil being in my ministry. I'm tired of the enemy trying to take the things that God has promised me. You know what, the, you know what we need to do with the devil? 
we cast him down. We take him up and we cast him out. You know what that means? That means if you were talking in fight terms, yeah. I knocked you down and then I picked you up and then I threw you out. I knocked you down and then I picked you back up and then I kicked you out. Somebody needs to get that way. Somebody needs to go. Uh, somebody needs to serve notice on the enemy and say, I've had it with you. You're not going to be in this mess no more. You're not, gonna, you're not allowed to make a mess of my life anymore. You're not allowed to torment me. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to mess with me. You're not allowed to be in my body. You're not allowed to be in my back causing me pain that I can't sleep at night. You're not allowed to, amen, be in my neck that every time I turn my head on the pillow, I'm just not comfortable because my neck hurts. You're not allowed to be arthritis in my body. You're not allowed to be cancer in my body. You're not allowed, amen. You're not allowed to be here. You're not allowed to be here. You're not allowed to be in my job. You're not allowed to be in my marriage. You're not allowed to be in my relationships. You're not allowed, amen. Restoration. I'm talking about restoration. Well, guess what? After restoration, see, we've gotten them confused. After restoration comes revival. See, that's what the scripture means when judgment first begins at the house of God. See, every time that the word judgment, you look at the word judgment as being negative. The word judgment is really when he says judgment begins first at the house of God. Well, what is judgment? Judgment is saying, well, I think this is right and I think that's wrong. And so we need to get this right. And when you get this right, this is what you're going to walk into. Are you hearing me? Judgment begins at the house of God. And when judgment begins at the house of God, He sets it right. And it goes into correction. It goes into repentance. And it goes into restoration. Now you'll see that in Jesus' ministry. First, John the Baptist came and that was correction. Then Jesus came and Jesus brought repentance and restoration. He restored. That's why he came to Israel first. He came to Israel because he had to go to the lost sheep of Israel first to restore the nation. Those that accepted him. But then the apostles on the day of Pentecost went out into all the world to preach the gospel because that's revival. It's correction, it's repentance, it's restoration, and then it's revival. In Acts chapter 3, it says that whom the heavens, speaking of Jesus, said that whom the heavens must receive until the time of restitution. What does restitution mean? It means restoration. Whom the heavens must receive until the time of restitution or the time of, of restoring. Church, this is what I believe. I believe that God is waiting on us for us to get our act together. He is waiting on us to get a hold of this word. He's waiting on us. Amen. He's waiting on a people that will cry out. Catherine Kuhlman used to have a rug that she took with her. And it had the imprint of her body on it. Because she would lay for hours in prayer before she came out on the stage. A.A. Allen fasted so much. Anybody ever heard of A.A. Allen? I'm going to give you a little bit of correction right here. Anybody heard of Abraham Lincoln? How about Ronald Reagan? JFK? Richard Nixon? 
but you've never heard of some of the greatest preachers that have walked in America and across this nation over the past 100 years. Their lives are examples to us. If we know history, what we know of history is we know of history in the Bible, and then after that, people may know of some history in the Dark Ages and all those sort of nonsense. But around 1909, around eight, early 18, late 1800s, when a man by the name of Alexander Dowie came about, I bet nobody in here except for Pastor Mike and maybe a few people have ever even heard of Alexander Dowie. A.A. A. Allen, they used to call him man, God's man of faith and power. And he fasted so much that he had to put safety pins in his pants sometimes to keep his pants on. He said that after a service, he would, after a service was over, sometimes he'd go and they'd eat. And his service would last till midnight, one o'clock in the morning sometimes because he would pray, he would lay hands on everybody that was in that prayer line. And his tent could hold 20,000 people. He could be praying for sometimes upwards of 5,000 people a night. Can you imagine praying for that many people? His clothes drenched, casting out devils. A.E. Allen, A. E. Allen was a great man of God, and he was one of the first men to stand up that was in the church that fought against racism in the 1950s. He was, the first, he was the first evangelist that had a black worship leader by the name of Gene Martin. And the Ku Klux Klan threatened to kill him whenever he would go places to preach in Alabama. And one time they had threatened him. They said, if you let that worship leader get up, we'll shoot you. And so that night when A. E. Allen stood before the crowd, he started his message like this. Well, there's been some people threatening to shoot me. And he said, I want you to do it now before my message gets started. <laughs> he was arrested in Dallas, Texas because blacks and whites could sit together. There were no lines that marked it off. Blacks on one side, whites on the other side. It grieved me when all of this thing broke out over the racial things over this past year to hear some of the preachers say, well, racism was in the church. Honey, the church has been kicking out racism forever. Amen. Holy Ghost people have been getting rid of racism from the beginning. Look at the Azusa Street Revival. There were blacks, whites, Asian. They were side by side. There was no segregation in that. There's no color in the Holy Ghost. Come on now. We're all one family. Come on now. Amen. And you don't know about him. So I've got to, I'm going to encourage you today. Find out about these men. Find out about your history. That's good. Find out about it. So you can pick up that mantle and be those men and women to this next generation because they moved in power and they changed things. And it was by their word and it was by the anointing that was on their lives. And the reason why we have churches the way that we have churches today is because of those men and women. It was revival. And God's getting ready. And He wants to bring a revival to this nation. He wants to bring a revival to the nations of the world. But church, we got to get ready. And we got to start restoring. We got to start in correction. Things that make us uncomfortable. If I'm making you uncomfortable today, good. If right now you're disagreeing with me, good. Because that's going to stretch you. Amen. And anything that... Uh, Needs to be fixed. Pastor can fix it when I go. <laughs> Correction, instruction, repentance, restoration, and then revival. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for something to happen. 
How many is ready for something to happen? How many received of this word today? I want you to stand to your feet with me. Could I, could I have the worship team back up? And could we sing that, that blood song that you guys were singing? Oh my goodness, I love the blood songs. Oh man, I'm doing good. It's just 12. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I just want to take a minute and let's let's worship God a second. Can we do that? Can we just can we just lift up our voices for a second? Can you lift up your hands? Can you just begin to praise Him in this place? Can you just begin to thank Him? say, preacher, I I don't really feel like praising right now. I'm kind of tired. I'm hungry. I want to go home. But I'm asking you to be obedient. Lift up your hands and begin to praise Him. Don't stand in the way of somebody else getting something. Let's reach out to Jesus today. God wants to heal. God wants to minister. God wants to touch you where you're at. If you're not saved, today could be the day of salvation for you. If you're not in the place with God that you need to be, today can be the day that you get in that place. Today can be the day of change. If you're sick in body, Jesus is here to heal you if you believe it. No man can do anything except faith in Christ and Jesus I believe we preach Jesus today and I believe the presence of the Lord is here to heal save and deliver so I'm asking you a question I'm going to count to three and when I hit three if you want prayer in your life I want you to come up here and we're going to pray for you Pastor Mike will be up here. Brother Steve will be up here. We're going to pray for you. And whatever you have need of, God's going to answer prayer today if you believe it. And that's the thing. You got to believe it. You got to believe it. That's what makes it happen. I can't do anything. But the Holy Ghost can do everything. I'm going to count one. One. I want you to come up if you need something. Two. Don't miss out. You can get a miracle today. You can get a healing today. You can get your life right with God today if you need to. Three. I want you to come up here. You need something. I want you to come up here. We'll pray for you.
can't control I will know I love you, God I will know I love you, God Set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I will know I love you, God I will know I love you, God Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul. I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God Set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God song again hallelujah hallelujah father we thank you lord for the work that you're doing hallelujah huh there's still people that want to be prayed for Sit a fire down in my soul. they want some minister if steve's gonna be or steve Liddell's gonna be down here still want prayer hallelujah thank you father Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control.
you, sir. Thank you so much. I, I, I feel so blessed and overwhelmed. And I was laying there and I couldn't even move my body. Yes. It's, it was so heavy. Yes. And then I just see the light. And it was, oh, it was so overwhelming. You need him. You need him. You need him. Oh, shot that idiot. Oh, shot that Take it, take it, take it. Take it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody else need prayer? Don't let this opportunity pass. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. 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 Let's rejoice. Let's give the Father some glory. Father, we thank you. We glorify your name. Father, we glorify your name. We glorify your name. We glorify your name. Hallelujah. Now, if this might have been just a hair strange to you, uh, welcome to my world. Uh, this is the way I was raised. And if we didn't leave church with about eight or nine people still slain in the spirit and would just let them find their way out of the church sometimes we'd come and we'd go eat something and then come back and they'd still be there hallelujah but I'm telling you when they got up <laughs> there was something different there was something different thank you father thank you father Hallelujah. I need a couple of ladies, some prayer warriors. I want you to come over here and just kind of get down next to Mary. I want you to be praying in the Holy Ghost over her. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. So when the power of God shows up in such a way, through the evangelistic gift, there is the the anointing of signs and wonders that happens but then there's also just even in our congregation we need to realize that as the anointing shows up it allows him to minister to them where they're at and so what Liddell could knock you down if he wanted because of the martial arts stuff that he has training wise I mean but it's the power of God that when you submit to him, then you just lose all ability to be able to stand. And you see this all throughout the word. They fell before him on their face. And that's what we would term in our vocabulary, being slain in the spirit. But there's more to that. I love Catch the Fire in Toronto that they had revival for 20 plus years and still are going through revival even with COVID going on in their, their church. But there were people that have come out of that ministry. Bill Johnson is one of them. Has anybody heard of Bill Johnson? And he would, be, he would go up there and be slain in the spirit. And Carol Arnett, which her and her husband led that, out, lead that outreach. They just handed it over there in their 70s. She wrote a book called Soaking in the Spirit. Now, I love this. Now, listen to this. When Heidi Baker, I heard of Heidi Baker, when she'd go out in the spirit, they'd have to just wheel her out in a, in a wheelchair because she just couldn't walk. But Carol, she would, she would say, no, don't get up yet. The, Lord, the presence of the Lord has come upon you and just stay here and just receive from him. She would pray in the spirit over some of these people for three hours. But see, we got a, we got a time. We can't, we can't play for three. Hello. And it's, isn't it amazing where that we don't see the power of the Holy Ghost much anymore because we got a schedule. Pastor Mike, it's 12, 14. Uh, your phone is buzzing you telling you need to stop correction repentance right what's the third one restoration then revival
this is normal. Everybody say, this is normal. Why? Because you live in the supernatural realm. This is normal. This is normal. I'm tired of playing church. Because it's only, it's only when we host the Holy Ghost in such a way that we give him permission to operate. That when he then begins to operate, then we then will begin to see those that come through those doors that need redemption. They need to be set free. And it is going to be by the demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And it's going to see revival begin to be leashed in our house. So, John, I want you to do me a favor and put two buckets at, uh, right there by the communion and one on the camera stand. We were, of course, to remind you that you can still give to the church. We've got the buckets or the boxes back there. But I want to be a blessing to my brother. You plant seed in good ground. If I, get, if I get a package of tomato, or I, nobody buys tomatoes that way. If I go buy a tom, uh, cucumber, no, they don't buy cucumbers that way either. Okra. <laughs> I go plant okra seed, then I'm going to come back and expect okra. And if I want to see revival and I want to see correction and restoration in my life, then I'm going to plant seed in that ground. And so I, I want to see revival break out into Cushing. I want to see that. Well, whoa, 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 whoa. Shouldn't we see that in Stillwater first? No, because you got to sow some seed to begin to reap a harvest. And sometimes, and not sometimes, God expects us to sow into someone else before we see the harvest in our own lives. And so you can write it out to World Harvest and write special speaker, or you can text and give online a special speaker box on there. You can drop cash, uh, credit cards. Just put on there a little sticker that your limit is $15,000. Don't go over this. You could use that, right? He'd get a brand new tent. He's renting one right now. He'd just buy one. This is good ground, all right? And so I just want to encourage you to sow. As uh, John, do we have those buckets back there? Good. All right. I'm going to pray over you. <laughs> we had a baptism today. That was awesome. She was baptized in the Holy Ghost Sunday. We had two baptisms of the Holy Spirit yesterday, last Sunday. Amen. Listen, we need to be operating in His power, in His realm. And just like I've been telling you over and over again, when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you're just not just praying something that uh, is just going out in the air. You're sinking or synchronizing your heart with the Master. (laughs) Ha ha. Woo. You don't need another sermon. It's a good word. I'm going to do this and I'm going to pray over you. If you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we did a prayer of salvation. We didn't see anybody raise their hands, but if you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we've never had the evidence of speaking in tongues, and you want us to pray with you, and we want you want to ask Jesus to baptize you in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and fire. That's what John said he'd do. If that's you and you want to do that, I want you to come down today before you leave, and I'm going to pray over you and dismiss you. I'm sorry that we didn't have potluck this today or fellowship dinner. We had an awesome wedding yesterday. Congratulations to the Goebbels over here. They only have three more to go. So if you ever get a chance to lay your hands upon that man's bald head and just anoint him, because he's going to need some anointing after that wedding. Hallelujah. That was an awesome. Who was here at the wedding yesterday? <laughs> Man, it was awesome. It was awesome. God showed up. It was a really a powerful moment. We, we danced. We rejoiced. Um, yeah, anyway, it was good. I, didn't, I danced a little with my wife, but it was sweet. I had a good time. We do need lessons. All right, all right. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
meet me down here. Father, I thank you for this group of people. I thank you that we see revival in our midst. I thank you, Father. <laughs> Go and be revival in your place. Go and be revival. The seed of a revival has been planted in your heart. I'm the one that brings forth the increase. I'm the one that brings forth that. You just sow, you just water. Let me, he says, bring forth the harvest. I release you, he says in Jesus' name. I release you to go into the fields. They're ripe and ready. Bring in those that do not know me. Begin to be a witness in my name. I have anointed you and I have given you my power and my authority. Go, he says, go. As you begin to go, I will anoint you. Do not worry. Do not fear about what to say because I have my Holy Spirit upon you. I have anointed you with this power, with might. I have endued you. Go and be the light and the salt in your world. Lead them to salvation. Bring them into a new birth relationship. Baptize them in water. Baptize them in the power of the Holy Ghost. Allow my revival to flow through you, he says. Go and take dominion, because I have subdued the enemy. I have placed him under your feet. <laughs> he is but someone that you could laugh at. <laughs> Just as my brother Liddell said, I've knocked you out, I've picked you up, and I threw you out. <laughs> and someday I will chain you up and throw you in the pit of hell. And there'll be many of us that will look from the corridors of heaven and say, is this the one? Is this the one that caused so much trouble in my life? The Father says, rule and reign. Rule and reign. I'm training you to reign. Reign in this life. Go in my name. In my name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad when Jesus shows up in the house? You guys go take dominion over your world. I appreciate you coming today. Be sure to show a blessing to my brother. Give, give, and give. Amen. God bless you. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Come meet me down here.